This is P uh, Patri Friedman, and he was telling me how to pronounce it because he's Italian, so it's actually Patri Friedman, Friedman right? And he's the founder of the Seasteading Institute, which is, uh, has a vision of creating a new frontier for humanity by building floating nations on the open sea. We probably all know somebody we'd like to put on those floating nations at some point, yeah, yes. Uh, so I was talking to uh, Pat III beforehand and I asked him if he had a PhD and he said, no, but I have two master's degrees, does that count? So I figure when you add those up, they certainly do. And you've heard of Dorothy's red shoes, you have to take a look at Pat III's red feet. Please welcome Pat III Friedman. <laughs> to say that this is an incredible setting here on the beach, not only an incredible setting for this event, but you know, for me personally, since my talk is going to be about how the oceans are our future, and it should be really easy to convince you of that in this lovely location. If at any time during my talk you feel yourself experiencing any doubts or concerns, I urge you to just look back over your right shoulder at the Pacific and let those blue waves washing in just wash away all your doubts and believe. All right, so I'm going to try to give you an answer to a very old, very hard problem, and that's the problem of how can we make government work better. Okay. Now, since this is an old, hard problem, my answer is going to be, you know, just a little bit completely and totally different from anything you've ever heard. And we shouldn't be surprised if an answer to a very old, very hard problem is very different, right? Because the obvious things have already been tried. That it is not going to cut it. So the answer, whatever it is, is probably not going to be very obvious. What we're probably going to need is some grand, exciting theory of how seasteading will transform the world. And that's what I'm going to try to give you. Um, because of the time length, I'm going to skip the technical and strategic aspects and just focus on inspiring and motivating you with this grand vision. And I'll note as a, a brief aside that a number of news stories on seasteading have commented on how seasteading sounds like something out of the plot of a James Bond movie. Really, I'm not sure what they're talking about. Yes. All right. So I'm going to give you a perspective on politics that is unusual, that's different, that looks at politics uh, in a different way and on a different level than most of what you hear. It's very natural to blame the problems of politics, our dissatisfaction with government, on bad laws or bad politicians, because they're the most concrete manifestation we have. But I'm going to try to convince you that the problems are actually in our flawed political systems, and more importantly, in the global government industry, which has certain characteristics that prevent the kind of innovation and progress and growth and quality that we see in almost all other industries, the kind of things that John talked about. One of the key things that you need in order to see this perspective is to drop all of the moral and emotional baggage that you usually associate with government. I want you to just try for the next 15 minutes to think about government with the business part of your mind, the part of your mind that shops, not the part of your mind that votes. I want you to think about government as a product where citizens get certain public services in return for taxes, where businesses and, to a lesser degree, people choose where to live based on the quality of those services compared to their cost. Now, much of the value of the product of government comes from the rules. Here in the USA, for example, our government product uses this document, the Constitution, as one of its core technologies, this set of rules. Now, like any industry, in the government industry, the, the quality of the different products of different sets of rules varies widely. Um, unlike all men, all rules are not created equal. In fact, what rules you use can profoundly affect what happens in your society. This is a picture of the Korean Peninsula at night. We can see that South Korea lit up like a Christmas tree. In North Korea, there's a couple of little dots, probably like Kim Jong-il's mansion and nuclear weapons factory, maybe. 
So these are two countries that started with the same people, the same culture, the same resources, and just used two very different sets of rules and got incredibly different outcomes. What rules you use really matters. And so finding ways to innovate to find new sets of rules is incredibly important for humanity. Now, a natural question to ask is, how good is our current technology? How good is representative democracy, which is kind of the industry standard government technology right now? You know, I mean, all the top countries use it pretty much. So, you know, can it be improved? How good is it? I mean, obviously, we're dissatisfied often with the performance of our government. So there's an important question. Is it just that we're humans and we're always dissatisfied? That, you know, we can always find things to complain about? Is it that people are uneducated, apathetic, that we haven't implemented things right? Or could it be that there are things in the nature of representative democracy that actually predictably lead to certain bad outcomes? Now, it turns out that we don't have to just kind of figure out the answer to this question here and now, and I didn't have to figure it out. There's a whole school of economics called public choice theory, which is about these kinds of questions. And it gives us an answer. Unfortunately, it's you know, not a very good answer, but economics doesn't always tell you what you want to hear. So you can learn from the widely unread Mansur Olson that while democracy is much superior to rule by an entrenched elite, it actually predictably and consistently chooses bad laws. Now, my time here is too short to disillusion you with the romantic, romantic idea of democracy. Um, but I'm just going to try to essay a brief explanation of one of the most common and easiest to understand ways in which democracies consistently choose bad laws. And that's the way in which they reward special interests over broad ones. So if you watch the news, you may notice that there's this pattern. It seems like special with special access to government always win out in the political process. You know, you can pick your, your, your favorite topic, the bailout of the Wall Street banks, the fact that British Petroleum has a legal limitation on how much liability it's exposed to for the oil spill, whatever you like. This is not an accident. Consider a law which benefits each of 100 people by a million dollars each. Now, this same law costs each of the 300 million Americans one dollar. So this law has a benefit of $100 million and a cost of $300 million. It's a bad law. Its costs are worse than its benefits. This kind of law in a democracy will pass every time. In fact, to an economist, it almost seems as if democracy is a system designed for passing this kind of law. Why? Well, do you people know about every law up for Congress that is going to cost you a buck? Of course you don't, right? You have better things to do with your time. You know, you could be out playing rock band. But those hundred people with a million dollar interest, you can bet that they know about this law. They probably wrote this law. They'll be willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars lobbying for this law, because when they get their million, they still turn a profit. Still turn a, still turn a, still turn a hundred people. Still turn a with a million. Still turn a interest. Still turn a you can bet. Still turn a know about this. Still turn a, still turn a probably wrote. Still turn a law. They'll be willing to try hundreds of thousands of dollars try this law. Try when they get their try they try profit. Try try special hundred people special with a million special interest special you can be special know about this special special probably wrote special law special they'll be willing special hundreds special of thousands there's this dollars there's this this law there's this when they get their there's this they there's this profit there's this there's this there's this hundred people. There's this with a million. There's this interest. There's this. You can. It seems like know about this. Seems like. Seems like probably wrote. Seems like law. Seems like they'll be willing. Seems like hundred. Seems like of thousand. Seems like dollars. Seems like this law. Seems like when they get their up snuff, they up snuff profit. Up snuff. Up snuff. Up snuff. Hundred people. Up snuff with a million. Up snuff interest. Up snuff. You can up snuff know about this. Up snuff. Up snuff probably wrote the law. That they'll be willing. 
not because this was intended, not because it was expected, it just happens to turn out to be the result of this set of rules. This is the kind of argument, I think, which is why people call economics the dismal science. I don't know, I think it's nice. All right, so suppose we grant that there are these problems with democracy. Well, does it even matter? I mean, it only matters if there's something better, if there are some better potential political systems out there which might have less problems. You know, Churchill pointed out that democracy may be flawed, but it's the best thing we've found so far. Personally, I find this sort of argument from lack of imagination to be really weak. Uh, let me give you three quick reasons why. First, every new idea at some point was unknown. There was a time when people looked at monarchy where sovereigns ruled by divine right and said, it's the best we've found so far, probably the best system there is, and I'm very glad that they did not stick with that. The second reason is, look, we've only tried a tiny number of the possible <coughs> ways to organize a society. If we imagine that every point in this room represents one of the ways to organize a society, how many have we tried? You know, maybe as much as the space inside my fist. What's the chance that the best way lies in that space out of all the possibility there is? Almost none. Third and most importantly, let's think about all the advances that there have been. Let's think about all the advances in psychology, economics, information technology, and every other science that bears on how you can create a good society. I mean, we have options for organizing ourselves now that weren't available 20 years ago, let alone 230 years ago when the US Constitution was written. I mean, the founding fathers were pretty smart, but they didn't know about the internet. There are probably some new ways to organize ourselves that haven't been found yet. So if you buy this idea, we're faced with a conundrum, right? If, if rules are incredibly important, if, if rules are a form of technology, if better rules are possible, why haven't we seen them? Why don't we see governments innovating, experimenting, evolving the way that so many other things do? You know, why is it that we throw out our computers and our cell phones every few years? That over the course of decades, our cars get much safer and much more efficient? Why don't we see that same progress with government? Why is this industry different? The answer is actually pretty simple. Knowledge advances through many small-scale experiments, through a process of trial and error. We call this the scientific method. It's not exactly revolutionary unless you apply it to government, in which case it may literally be revolutionary. In academia, we call these experiments research. In Silicon Valley, where I come from, we call them startups. It's kind of the same thing, except that with the startups, if it works out, you can get rich, which is pretty awesome. But in the government industry, there are no startups. There's no startup sector. Why? One important quality of an industry is what's called the barrier to entry. That is, what is the cost of getting into this industry, of doing a startup, right? For the web industry, one of these laptops, either one, probably the Mac would be better. <laughs> That's your barrier to entry. For the car industry, you need a team of automotive engineers. You need a shop that has the ability to prototype cars. It's, it's moderately high. And as a result, we see far more web startups than we see car companies. It's what you expect given the difference in barrier to entry. Well, what's the barrier to entry to starting a country? All land is claimed. You can't buy sovereignty. So to start a new country, you basically need to win a war, a revolution, or an election. It's ridiculous. Colossally expensive. The war or the revolution are going to be bloody. The election is not bloody, but you don't even really get to try your new system. You're still trapped inside some old system with some entrenched interests. It's, it's insane. If there's some peaceful entrepreneur with some brilliant idea for a new way to run a society, he's got no way to try it. It's no wonder that government doesn't evolve. But that's not the only problem. There's also the, barrier, the, the cost of switching. How does a startup grow and get market share from the other firms? By getting customers to switch to this new, better product. 
Well, the cost of switching countries right now is really high. You gotta sell your house, move your stuff, deal with changes in culture and language. It's, it's pretty awful. And this discourages startups, because even if you can start them, they can't grow by attracting customers. All right, now that we have this theory, we can see the answers. We can see that the solution is not to complain about or fix our politicians or laws, but to enable startups. And of course, the best way to do this is seasteading. If this is too much of a jump, again, just look out that way and let the waves soak in. So see the, the easy way to see how seasteading helps is the way it improves the barrier to entry. So the ocean is a frontier. It's empty and unclaimed. We don't have to win a war, a revolution, or an election. Our estimates suggest that hundreds of people and tens to hundreds of millions of dollars could create one of these floating cities. A big improvement. And what's mind-blowing is how it changes the cost of switching. This is the Royal Caribbean's Freedom of the Seas and our state building on the same scale. It's literally true that on the ocean, things as large as skyscrapers move on a daily basis. So you could build your ocean cities in a modular way so that they could be rearranged. You could change countries without leaving your house by detaching from one and moving to another. If a seastead city passes an unpopular law, the leaders may wake up the next morning and find City Hall looking over a vast, empty, peaceful ocean at a new peaceful city a few miles away, consisting of all their old buildings and residents. Together, this decrease in the barrier to entry and cost of switching will create what I call Politics 2.0. Many small startups trying new things, innovating and competing for citizens. And you don't have to move to benefit. The competitive pressure from these startups will force existing countries to improve or face a drain of brains and capital to these new countries. So seasteading is not about just running away to a new place and kind of vaguely hoping that the old problems won't follow you. The ocean is actually a fundamentally different medium which will lead to a better society. And even though this is about new societies, it's not utopian. It's not about some one vision of a better society. It's kind of meta-utopian. We don't know the answer. We don't claim to know the best society. We just believe that if you let people experiment, the process of science and of markets will find something better. And if taking over 68% of the world is not big enough for you, actually, this is not just a plan for world domination, but galactic domination. The barrier to entry to space right now is very high, but it's coming down, and in decades, it'll be cheap enough to colonize the galaxy. And when you talk about this benefit of mobility, space is even better than the oceans, right? To rearrange an ocean city, you need like big diesel engines. To rearrange a space city, you can get out and push. <laughs> so if I'm right and current civilization suffers from this landlock, that's the bad news. And the good news is 68% of the Earth's surface and almost the entire universe have the right qualities to make a more competitive, more dynamic society. <sighs> so take a deep breath. And this is the, the vision that burns in my mind and makes it hard for me to sleep. Um, I'm also working on making this vision a reality, but it's not really time to talk about that. So I'll just give you a very quick montage of all the things that we're doing, all the things that we've done. Books, conferences, floating festivals, dancing to I'm on a boat. New floating festivals, inspiring startups and graduate theses, lo location studies, contests, conferences, all kinds of stuff. If you're interested in learning more, after TEDx tonight, we're going to have a meetup at Yogi's Del Mar, not far away. Come ask me any questions you have. And please check out our website, cstin.org, to learn more about my big idea. Thank you. Thank you.